fan, uh, uh, Lord of the Rings fans, uh, think, think of our Alabama wall like Helm's Deep. It is solid, it is strong, but Helm's Deep has one weakness. You know, it has one spot where it can be blown up and, you know, all the abortions can get back in through. And I think we need to tighten up uh, that restriction of the first available opportunity. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. And welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. My next guest is somebody that you're quite familiar with who is here to discuss what's going on with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which, of course, our entire show is sort of centered around today. And uh, been on with uh, us a lot is somebody that has a background in constitutional law, and both he and his wife are pro-life activists. Uh, his wife actually was an attorney that worked for a agency specifically on abortion, and he has been working for the Foundation for Moral Law and is currently the president of ALCC. So let's go ahead and bring him on. Matt Clark, thanks so much for being back on the show with us, man. Absolutely, Gil. Thank, Thank you for having me. me. Yeah, it's always great to have you. We know that uh, you've been on the show several times and are a personal friend of mine. But, you know, putting our professional career aside, like we were both just elated to see what happened Friday. It's It's been a great day for this movement. It has been a great, uh, a long, long time coming. Uh, but before I get into the actual like meat and potatoes of this, just your initial reaction. It was, it was amazing. amazing. I, I think, think it's by far, far the United States, States Supreme Court's finest moment. Um, you, you, you think about some of the opportunities that the Supreme Court has had in the past to end major injustices. Um, sometimes there are injustices that they caused, like Brown versus Board of Education. I think there's a good argument that that was the Supreme Court's you know, finest moment because you know it, it finally declared that segregation was unconstitutional. Uh, you could argue it was the Supreme Court's fault in the first place because in Plessy versus Ferguson they gave it green light, but in 1954 they owned us to their mistake and they reversed it. Well, it's kind of the same thing here, except the evil that was remedied was far worse than in segregation. Don't get me wrong, segregation was awful, it was evil, it was unconstitutional, and it needed to go. Um, but in terms of how bad and evil it is, I think murder is the worst of the worst. Um, and here, while well, unfortunately the court's decision in Dobbs did not make um, abortion illegal across the nation, it finally freed up the state to protect life if they so choose to do so. And so um, we're finally seeing the, the end of an era that has resulted in the loss of uh, over 60 million lives, and that is absolutely incredible. So um, from the uh, uh, Supreme Court's uh, early days until now, I think this was the greatest decision of all time. No, I, I couldn't agree more. It was definitely the biggest court decision of my lifetime, which is part of the reason that I just kind of came out of the uh, the shadows to do another show, even though I don't do many of those. And I mean, it's just, it, it is a momentous day. And one of the things that you mentioned is something I actually wanted to ask you about anyway, when it comes to what this Supreme Court decision actually did. One of the criticisms that you're hearing a lot from people on the left, uh, pundits, elected officials, is that this is the Supreme Court forcing their beliefs on the entire country, and uh, many are referring to it with the colloquialism of it's the death of democracy, this is authoritarian fascism, that kind of thing. Uh, but I've read the opinion, or at least not all of it, but I've read most of it, and the introduction, like the very first thing in the opinion is we actually don't think that we can decide this issue which is why we give it back to the states and back to the people, and now you have the ability to do that. So uh, give us a little bit of insight into how all of that works. You nailed the cable. The criticism that this is undemocratic or judicial activism is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, but that's not what it's supposed to be. It just is. You know, if you're going to argue that this is undemocratic, court is saying we are literally going to give the people the right to vote on this. That It doesn't get more democratic than that. Um, and as far as opposing new values, the, the court declared absolute neutrality on the question of when life begins, whether unborn children are people uh, entitled to constitutional protections. They, they, they went full on agnostic on that and instead sent the issue back to uh, people in the states to decide for themselves. So, you know, it's. I, I don't think I've ever seen an instance of people getting more upset over. 
um, the court declared a new trial will be on an issue than, than this. And it's, it's just, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so getting back to your uh, your original question here, um, you, you, you are correct. So as you know very well, and I'm sure most of your listeners know, the federal government is a government of enumerated powers. And that also uh, goes for uh, the, the, the specific rights that are protected in the Constitution, too. Um, although we have more rights that are not uh, explicitly enumerated um, in the Constitution, uh, the Constitution protects only certain rights that are explicitly spelled out. And in a row, um, what happened was the, the Supreme Court looked at it and said, well, you know, kind of based on the 14th Amendment and maybe the 9th Amendment, although we can see there is no right to abortion explicitly in the Constitution, we think we can kind of find the right to an abortion there. And so because of that, the states do not have the liberty to restrict abortions um, before viability is essentially what they held. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's, that's generally just a bit. And the court kept uh, that court holding in 1992 in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Here, the Supreme Court looked at it and they said, all right, look, um, if you pick up a copy of the Constitution and read it, there is no right to an abortion in there. And when it comes to recognizing rights that are not explicitly in the Constitution, um, the practice that we go with is we ask whether those rights are deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions. And there is no serious argument at all that there is such a right rooted very deeply in this nation's history and traditions when it comes to abortion. Um, at the time the 14th Amendment was ratified, which is what you know the, the right to abortion was supposedly based on, um, abortion was outlawed in almost every state. And even coming up to 1973, some, at that, when the court decided to grow, some of the states had loosened up their abortion restrictions, but it was still illegal in most states. And so you, you cannot make a serious argument with a straight face that there is a right to abortion uh, very deeply rooted in this country's history and traditions. So, Well, I think that that kind of highlights the difference in those two opinions, because Roe, and, and this was part of their opinion, like I'm not just editorializing, part of their opinion was this is very controversial, so we're going to step in and decide it. This decision was essentially, this is very controversial, which means the court doesn't have the right to decide it. We have to give it back to the people. Yeah, basically. I mean, if the Constitution doesn't address it, then the Tenth Amendment uh, applies, which means that the matters is reserved to the states and to the people. Um, you're right that, that that was one thing that uh, the court was trying to do in Roe, and definitely in cases, they were trying to step in and settle a controversial issue. Um, a lot of people, uh, especially Justice Clarence Thomas, who's my favorite justice on the court, he has compared this a lot to the infamous Dred Scott decision where the court saw that the nation was kind of on the verge of war, that this was a very controversial issue. And instead they said, well, forget the Missouri Compromise and what the Constitution actually says, we're gonna step in and decide this issue. So we decided it, everybody's happy, y'all can stop fighting about it. That did not work very well at no. all. And neither did the court trying to step in and solve the abortion issue. So instead now it's saying, okay, um, this is controversial. The Constitution does not clearly answer the question in our opinion. So the people get to talk about it, try to persuade each other to vote on it. That's how this is going to be solved. Yeah, and that really does bring me to, and tell me if my legal analysis is slightly off, uh, but I was talking about this just a second ago um, in the earlier segment. What this really does is it's not that it settles the issue. It's just beforehand, the pro-life movement was essentially, they're saying, you can fight this issue, but you have to fight with both hands tied behind your back. Really, all this does is makes it a fair fight. Like pro, pro-life pro people, you can you have the ability to go to your states and try to make this illegal. Pro-abortion people, you have the ability to go to your states and try to make it as legal and as available as possible. And so it's really more of a, we're going to put this on an even playing ground now as opposed to, because I mean, personally, I think that they showed a ridiculous amount of judicial restraint because I think you actually can make a, I, I don't know if I have the ability to do it, but I think you actually can make, based on what I've seen, a constitutional recognition of life at conception, but they didn't do that. All they did was look at it and say, uh, we really can't decide, so we're going to let this go back to you. Um, am I correct in that understanding? Yes, absolutely. Caleb, if you ever decide you want to go to law school, let me know. I'd be happy to write you a letter of recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. you. An excellent lawyer. Really would. Um, but you, you absolutely nailed it. It's um, So there are a couple of uh, separate but related issues when it comes to this case. The uh -huh. first issue is whether the Constitution recognizes 
a right to an abortion? And that is a very easy no. It, that, that is easy to answer. The second question is whether the Constitution protects the right to life for the unborn. The two are obviously very related, but they are separate questions. And um, it's very easy. You don't even really need to be a lawyer. All you need to do is be able to read and understand in English to look at the 14th Amendment and say it's the most ridiculous thing ever to say that there, there's a right to an abortion based on what the text actually says. So um, getting rid of Roe and, and, and shooting down the proposition that the court protects the right to an abortion was a very easy thing to do, and that's what the court did. You have to go a step further if you want to argue that the Constitution actually protects uh, the right to life for the unborn. Mm -hmm. Now, I, 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 I agree with you. I think there's a good case to be made, and I am among a uh, minority, but a vocal minority of conservative lawyers who think the Constitution actually does require um, the right to life to be protected from the moment of conception. Uh, within that crowd, we have the current Alabama Chief Justice Tom Parker, former Chief Justice Roy Moore, um, Josh Craddock, who's a Harvard grad. He wrote an uh, article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy that got a lot of attention about five years ago, making this case in detail, and I think he was right. Um, but basically that argument says this. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment says no state shall deprive to any person within their jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Now, if unborn children are people, then that means the state may not deny to them equal protection. What does that look like when it comes to abortion? It means that if the state decides everybody's going to be protected from murder, then it can't single out the unborn as a class of people that are not worthy of that protection because that's not equal protection of the law. So the Equal Protection Clause, in my opinion, gives the states two choices, either protect everybody from murder or nobody from murder. Those are the two scenarios in which uh, equal protection is, is met. So um, we right, and of, and murder actually is a state law. It's a state issue. The federal government yeah. doesn't enforce that just because they understand that this is something that the states can handle and and should handle. I mean, it goes back to the Tenth Amendment. And so, in the same sense, I don't really want the federal government setting murder laws. I I think that that would be a bad idea just because it makes more sense to let the individual states decide it. But kind of like you were saying, if the individual states do decide that. It's not fair for them to just take one specific class of people and say, you guys aren't protected. I think you, you nailed it. Um, yeah, classically, the right to protect um, life, liberty, and property, uh, you know, th those were what we call uh, police powers that are reserved to the states under the Ten Amendments. You know, the states have a quintessential power to protect uh, you know, the public welfare, the public health, the public safety, and the public morals legally. That's what we call the police power doctrine. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the Supreme Court has affirmed again and again that there is no federal police power. So when it comes to the power to protect the public safety and especially uh, protecting the right to life, that is a matter that has been classically reserved to the states. You don't see, you know, cops, uh, you don't see federal agents out there just prosecuting regular old murder cases. That happens at the state level. Um, so, so you're right. It, 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 with the way our structure set up, it really makes a lot of sense for this to best at the state level. But what the Constitution does say is, okay, if you're going to step into that and you're going to protect people from murder, um, you can't single out you know, uh, a group of people to take that protection away from. They couldn't back in 1868 when you know the black codes were you know singling out black people saying, yeah, they, they're kind of second class citizens. They don't get the same protections. You know, If you want to go lynch them, that's fine. You just can't do it to white people. And in 2022, it means that if you're going to protect everybody from murder, you can't single out the other more and say, oh, yeah, you can go kill them, and that's fine, but you can't kill the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that's kind of a good segue into what I wanted to get into is really where do we go from here and what this means for us, because uh, there's plenty of national shows that are going to do this on the federal level. What I really want to focus on for the next couple minutes is what does this mean for Alabama? We do have a trigger law which bans abortion and essentially makes it illegal in the state. So exactly what does that look like? What is going to be the outcome of this Supreme Court decision for Alabama specifically? And uh, if you could kind of dovetail this on the backside of it, a lot of people, especially on the left, are worried that this decision is going to necessitate that women who sought abortions either in the past or from this point forward are going to be tried for murder. Uh, is exactly what does that mean? How does the Alabama law work? And is that a valid concern? So those are excellent questions. Um, you write that after Dobbs, we have to, you know, 
take a look at where each state individually stands. The good news for Alabama is in 2019, we passed a pro-life law that at that point was the strongest in the nation. Uh, it was after Justice Kavanaugh replaced Justice Kennedy. We knew that the lower courts were going to strike it down. The whole point was to get it up for the U.S. Supreme Court and present a facial challenge to Roe. We, we didn't nibble at the edges of Roe, but we passed a law that you know could only stand if Roe was thrown out. Um, so the same day that the Supreme Court decided Dobbs, which overruled Roe, um, Attorney General Steve Marshall for the state of Alabama um, got the 2019 Alabama law back in force again. Uh, what happened was when we passed that law in 2019, all the pro-abortion, um, part of more specifically, the abortion clinics in the state sued to have uh, the law enjoined, which means a judge steps in and he tells the attorney general and the law enforcement officers of the state that you can't enforce that law right now because I think it's unconstitutional. Um, that case never made it out of the district court. I, I think what happened was shortly after that COVID hit, that screwed everything up, you know, threw a curveball at everybody. So it didn't make its way up through the appeals. Uh, but now that Dobbs has been decided, uh, the, the same day, Gen General Marshall filed a motion saying, you know, Judge, you need to lift that injunction because your whole basis for enjoining the law is gone. And Judge Thompson agreed. And even the abortion clinics themselves conceded. Yeah, we have no case anymore after uh, after Dobbs overruled Roe. So uh, the abortion clinic surrendered, the judge lifted the injunction. So now that law is in full force and effect in Alabama. Um, what the law does is that if uh, if an abortionist commits an abortion, um, it is punishable by a Class A felony, which is punishable by up to 99 years in prison. Um, the law does not prosecute mothers. So even if a woman uh, went to go get you know an abortion, um, you know, and, and she consented, and uh, the, the, the unborn child was killed with her, with her knowledge and consent, she could not be prosecuted because the law has not made it a criminal offense as to her. And, and, and while we can argue about whether, you know, that's completely just, I, I do think there, there is a, uh, something to be said for women being under pressure, either being strong armed by their, you know, their boyfriends to go get it done, and uh, being duped by these doctors that are supposed to get um, informed consent, but at the end of the day, the reality is there's no baby that will kill for money, all right? So that's why we're going after the abortionists, but not the mothers. Um, there are two exceptions to that law. Number one is if it's necessary to save the life of the mother. And while I hate that, I mean, I, personally, I think until technology gets to the point where, you know, it can eliminate that issue, um, I, I can understand why in the very, very, very rare case where the mother is going to die, um, it lets at least save the life of the mother. Uh, I don't think anybody has a real problem with that. The second one, though, this is what I'm concerned about. Um, there is a mental health exception for the mother. Now, that is that mental health exception is defined. I can't remember off the top of my head all of the, you know, criteria that are used, but but it's higher than just oh, it stresses me out the thought of having a baby, and, you know, so I need an abortion. Um, which is encouraging because there's a lot of states where basically all you have to do is find a left-leaning psychologist or counselor of some kind and they'll just rubber stamp your abortion. So uh, that has been the case because, you know, they may not have restrictions on early abortion, but they had restrictions on late-term abortion. And, and basically it was kind of like the marijuana laws in uh, California. Like if, if you want it, you can get it. Yeah, bingo. bingo. That's, that's that's exactly. exactly. Um, George, George Killer, Killer uh, pardon me, <laughs> pardon me. Look there, George Tiller, the late term abortionist from Kansas, uh, back in the day. That's exactly how he operated. Was you know Kansas law would um, only allow you to do a late term abortion if you could get multiple doctors to sign off on it. So he contracted with uh, some doctors that were just rapidly pro abortion, just like he was, who would rubber stamp you know all of the applications, and then he he could kill uh, you know any babies that made it into a late term pregnancy. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you, you're right. If, if this is not tight, then that's exactly what's going to happen here with this mental health exception. Um, what the legislature was trying to get at was this. They, they, they were concerned that in cases where the mother is so mentally unstable because of this that she may actually commit suicide, then kind of like the cases of um, the, the, the life of the mother, it's like, look, you know, if, if this isn't going to happen, we're going to have two deaths where one is going to be inevitable anyway, so let's just go ahead and let her get the abortion. Um, I don't think that is, uh, I, I don't think that part of the law is good. It, it, despite the, the safe, well, number one, I think it's, it's just, you know, not just, I mean, just 
mental disability is, is, is not a reason to kill an unborn child. It's just not. And then second, kind of what you talked about, I'm, I'm afraid that the abortionists in the state are going to get together and just get the requisite number of doctors to sign off on just about anybody that comes through the door. Um, and then they can have the abortion. So, um, well, I actually have a third concern too, because the dirty little secret that people who are on the pro-abortion side of the argument don't talk about and don't want people to know about is that there are actually very significant mental health repercussions that come with getting an abortion. And so the very mother that may actually kind of be on the fringes, I understand why we obviously wouldn't want her to commit suicide. I mean, that's, that's obvious that that would be the worst possible outcome. Uh, but if we have somebody that already is kind of on the fence with the, the mental health issues and then they wind up killing their baby and, and feeling that remorse and regret that typically comes with it with a lot of women, even women that happen to think abortion is perfectly morally acceptable, then we could actually make her mental health worse and make her more likely to commit suicide. And so, uh, you know, that, that's an uncommon result from abortion, but it does happen. And if we're talking about people that are already their mental health is sort of questionable, that could very well be something that 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 legal exception actually drives them toward. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Caleb. I mean, that, that it, we see similar arguments sometimes in um, the, the cases where, you know, people argue, like, if, you know, if, if kids aren't allowed to switch their genders, get surgery, and, um, you know, take, you know, puberty blocks are going to commit suicide. So, you know, the thing is, in, in that case, though, it's not addressing the root of the problem. And by letting them engage in that, it's actually going to drive them more towards suicide and problems like that than, than it would have been if you had not allowed them to do it. So it's the same thing in abortion cases. Um, because, look, at, you know, at the end of the day, you and I are both Christians, and we know that ultimately the, the root of the problem here is spiritual. Um, and when, okay, when, when you partake in killing an innocent human being, your conscience has a way of eating you up. And, and, and you know, in a way, God designed us to do that because it's a sign that, all right, you are in trouble, but that's where, you know, when you recognize that, that's where the cross comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not going to come to the cross and find forgiveness in Jesus Christ unless you first acknowledge that there's a problem. Now, what we absolutely don't want to have happen is post abortive women who wind up, whose guilt winds up eating them up to the point where instead of coming to repentance, they go into the ultimate act of despair and take their own lives. So listen, by the way, if there are any of you out there today that are listening there in that scenario, what we want to tell you here is this. You don't have to pay that price because Christ already paid it for you. Yes, just like all the rest of us, that, you know, all, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If, if it did take part in abortion, yes, that was a sin. But there's no sin that the cross of Jesus Christ cannot forgive. Okay, Christ shed his blood in your place so that you wouldn't have to. So uh, forgiveness of sins is available in his name. You don't have to work for it. It's by grace through faith. And if you need to be baptized, have even Caleb and I would be willing to volunteer to do that ourselves. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. That, so we, you know, that, that, that's one thing that um, uh, the, uh, the, the pro-abortionists, you know, argue a lot is you don't care about women. But for a lot of us that have been involved in this fight, We've not only been trying to stop abortions, but we have been trying to reach out to post-abortive women and, 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 and help them find redemption and healing and forgiveness so that they don't do something like that and wind up you know, beating themselves up or committing suicide or something like that. That is not at all the outcome that we want. And we are very much in favor of supporting Christian and pro-life ministries that helps these women find redemption and healing. Well, and that's the thing, too. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I could find somebody out there, but I personally, with the people that I work with, and I work with a lot of pro-life people, as you do, uh, I don't know anybody that their goal in this was always so we, we can prosecute women that have had an abortion. In fact, my next guest is uh, somebody that falls into that category. And so th there is forgiveness there. There is redemption. And uh, it's true that from a legal perspective, and you know this better than I do, even though I know you're not a criminal lawyer, uh, the law requires some kind of uh, process to go through, or it has requirements for a punishment to reconcile. Uh, it wouldn't do this with women and abortion in this case, as you just discussed. Uh, but the thing about the gospel is that isn't part of the process. The, the process was already taken care of. And so with us, mm -hmm. it's just coming to Christ, asking forgiveness and obeying him. And that's, that's where we come down on that. But uh, yeah, so as far as that goes, I guess the one last follow-up question uh, that I would have is, 
when it comes to the law, are there anything, is there anything that we as Alabamians who already kind of have a, a ban in place need to do? Is there any legislation that we should be pushing for with our representatives or uh, other people that we may elect? The, that's an excellent question, Caleb. So the first thing I think we need to do is hold our legislators' feet to the fire because it, it's strange. The, the, there are a fair amount of feckless Republicans uh, in Montgomery. Um, the, the, there are some good ones, but it, a lot of the people that voted for that 2019 pro-life law, um, when they saw the possibility that Roe might get thrown out, uh, they started speaking, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, maybe we were too harsh in, uh, in that. Maybe we need to start considering the exceptions like rape or incest or the health of the mother. So I think the first thing we need to do is pick up the phones and call the representatives and say, don't you dare lighten up any restrictions on that law. Um, we, we don't need to be more liberal with this. And then the second thing I think we need to do is uh, we need to push them to reconsider that mental health exception because um, for, for anyone out there that's Lord of the Rings fan, uh, Lord of the Rings fans, uh, think, think of our Alabama law like Helm's Deep. It is solid, it is strong, but Helm's Deep has one weakness. You know, it has one spot where it can be blown up and, you know, all the abortions can get back in through it. And I think we need to tighten up uh, that restriction of the first available opportunity. All right, and uh, one other one that's just kind of a follow-up and in in sort of along that same line of where do we go from here. You know, this decision technically was a 6-3, but realistically, if you read what Robert's concurrence said, it's really more of a 5-1-3 uh, because it, he makes very clear that what he would have tried to do is split the baby, and I don't mean that as a pun considering the subject matter. Um, he was going to try to split the baby to where uh, well, we don't actually get rid of Roe, but we do agree that the Mississippi case, that they came down on the right side of that. And so he was going to try to do something to keep Roe in place, which means that we're kind of on the border here, especially with a Democrat president in place. God forbid one of the conservative justices would, would pass away or have to resign or something like that. Um, if that does take place, would it be a kind of thing where, where we would basically have row or something similar to it recodified like how, how, how do i don't really know what we could do in that situation just more of a what would that look like that, that, that's an excellent question too um you, you're right that we had five conservatives that agreed to overrule row roberts agreed that he wanted to keep the mississippi 15 week law but he he didn't want to quite overrule row just yet because he didn't think it was necessary in that case um, so, so you're right. I mean, you, you can look at it and say we're, we're one vote away from undoing all the progress that we just made. Um, I think the good news is that let, let's say God forbid one of the five conservatives, um, you know, leaves the bench either due to death or retirement or disability or something like that. Um, even if President Biden was able to replace his appoint his replacement with a, uh, a pro-choice justice. Um, I do not think Dobbs would be overruled, and, and here's why. Roberts, um, he has a pattern of, of, you know, dissenting in cases where, you know, he disagrees with, but once a precedent is set, he will follow it. Uh, he, he's done that multiple times before, so he, so, so let's say, you know, uh, a case comes um, a couple of years from now with, with a Biden replacement from one of the conservatives, and, um, you know, the pro board say, don't follow Dobbs. Well, Roberts would probably actually disagree with that, and he'd probably put out a special letter and say, well, I thought we overrode Roe a little bit prematurely, but now that we've done it, it's a precedent, and if you want us to go back against that precedent, you got to walk through all the factors for, for whether a precedent ought to be overruled, and at that point, I don't think you can meet your burden. So I think Roberts would side with us if, let's say, two years from now, uh, Dobbs got challenged. Um, but well, that's kind of situationally good to hear, mm -hmm. but it's it's very bad in the sense that Roberts might be the only person in America that actually believes in precedent. And <laughs> I'm serious. Like, uh, I, I don't believe in precedent. I think it's ridiculous and silly. If, if the law is good and constitutional, you ought to uphold it. If it's bad, I don't care how long the precedent's been in place, you get rid of it. Uh, but, but the liberals, you know, they're kind of the same way. And frankly, I think they're right on that. Like the second that this became precedent, all of a sudden, none of the liberals cared about precedent anymore. So, <laughs> Um, Roberts might be the only person that actually legitimately thinks that precedent is important. I, I, I don't know of anybody else really off the top of my head that does. 
Yeah, yeah there, there, there are a few of them out there. I think, you know, Alito also believes in it, um, but he's got more of a consistent framework for how to decide when to follow it versus when not to. Whereas Roberts, um, I don't know, he's... Roberts is professionally torn. He, he's, he's not a liberal at heart. I think he is a conservative at heart, but he's compromised too much by the desire to protect the Supreme Court's image. So, But I, I think it's that part in particular that makes him more inclined to follow precedent than... Um, than, than his colleagues, because you know he, he can decide to look out for the court more than the Constitution sometimes. But in this case, that would actually work in our favor because if he's trying to right. look out for the court, he's like, well, regardless of whether I agree with that past decision, you made it and you have to stick by it, unless you can make a compelling case that we ought to throw it out. Right. Basically, if you like the status quo, then Roberts winds up being on your side. And this is one of the, I mean, for a long time. Uh, the status quo was not on our side because Roe was in place. Now, technically, the status quo is on our side. So, uh, but yeah, thank you for that analysis. And I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to just throw in here? Because uh, I, I got to tell you, I'm I'm pretty ecstatic about this. Like, I haven't been this excited about a Supreme Court case ever. Yeah, me neither. It, it absolutely is the Supreme Court's finest moment. Um, so I'd say, you know, thank God, praise God. And look, I, I feel I feel terrible about saying this. If this was just plain old Matt Clark in my personal capacity, I would just walk away. But, but as the president of the organization, I have to make a pitch here. Um, we were in a lot of the Dobbs case. Um, we filed an amicus brief uh, at the time where um, a lot of people didn't know whether the court was just going to push back on the viability standard or whether they're going to throw it out altogether. We filed a brief arguing that they should throw it out altogether, and we laid out a path for them to do it. And I'll tell you, I think the Supreme Court followed the blueprint that we presented about 90% of the way. So that was mm -hmm. that was pretty good. So um, folks listening, if you guys are looking to support an organization that gets in on fights like this and who the Supreme Court has proved right uh, today, they also proved this right in the gun rights case and the Coach Kennedy case today, um, please uh, consider giving to the Alabama Center for Law and Liberty. Our website is alabamalawandliberty.org. Come check us out. If you like what you see, consider getting on board with us. Absolutely, because like I was saying earlier in the interview, this fight isn't over. We've got a long way to go. I mean, this is really just the start of the fight on uneven playing ground. And so uh, legal organizations like yourself, they, that's going to be essential going forward, just as they were in, in getting this decision. All right. Well, I appreciate it, brother. Always good to talk to you. And uh, we will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Caleb. Thank Always great to be with you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That is Matt Clark. He is the president of ACLL. So if you do have any interest in donating, be sure to get in touch with them. Uh, that's going to be it for this interview. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a minute on Tactics. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell. If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see... I identify as a Hispanic woman, so if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade? <laughs>